Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, John. All right, so we are continuing our study in the book of Acts this morning. And uh, last week, we read about the death of Stephen. Full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Stephen was stoned to death for preaching the gospel. Stoned to death for doing signs and wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. And the account reads that on that day there arose a great persecution in the church. The first great persecution of the church. We saw how even in the midst of the great persecution, the church grew. We can say that even through the great persecution, the church grew. The mission of the God moved ahead. The followers of Jesus were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. And as they were scattered, verse 4 says, they went about preaching the word. We turn now into a major, it's a turning point, a major section in the book of Acts. Where we see the church growing into Judea and Samaria. And as we see the ministry expand, we also come across problems. And the same kinds of problems that we face today. And so I'm going to be reading from verse 4 of chapter 8 through verse 25. And I ask the congregation to please rise for the reading of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip and when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, for of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is God's word for God's people. Let us receive it as such. You may be seated. The passage I just read addresses one of the biggest problems in the church 
both then and now. It has to do with those who are professors of the Christian faith, but not possessors of the Christian faith. In other words, someone who says that they are a Christian and may even do the things that Christians do, but they have not been born again by the Spirit of God. A profession of Christ without possession of Christ is a false profession. It's a case of mistaken identity. The thing is that as Christians, we cannot know for sure about somebody else. We're not able to judge the heart of another person. However, there are some things that are evident in somebody born again. For instance, the Apostle John writes this, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's 1 John chapter 2. The Apostle James says it like this, So also faith by itself if it does not have works, it is dead. Not that we're saved by our works, but our faith in Christ produces good works. The Lord Jesus himself said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And he goes on to say, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And from the outset of our passage here, what we see is some fruit. The mission of God moves ahead and the Lord raises up leaders. We see this man, Philip, like Stephen. Philip was one of the seven that was chosen, ordained as essentially the first deacons of the church. You deacons, you future deacons, here scattered during the great persecution who went about preaching the word. Once again, we see it is not only the duty of the apostles, just as it's not only the duty of pastors to preach the word. He left Jerusalem because of the persecutions, but he did not go into hiding he left to Samaria, verse 5, proclaiming to them the Christ. And there's some fruit right there. At some point, the truth of the gospel, the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was raised from the dead, that he was the only Savior of men, it had been confirmed and established in Philip's mind. Something from within him caused him to go ahead preaching the word. Like many of you this week and, and how John prayed, I've been reflecting and, and, and watching a lot of the documentaries and footages of 20 years ago. We all can remember where we were that day. This year, more than other aspects of it, was Flight 93 in my mind. That was the, the plane that was headed towards Washington, D.C. It's about 40 passengers on board. From what I know, some of the passengers had learned that there were other planes that were flying into buildings. And at some point, it became confirmed and established in their minds we got to do so. That plane crashed in an open field instead of hitting a building not too far from here. Again, with, with Philip, something happened in his mind at some point. I have to proclaim this good news. 
Jesus was raised from the dead. He's the one. He's the Savior of the world. If you were a Christian, it must be that at some point it was confirmed and established in your mind and in your heart that Jesus took upon himself your sins, past, present, and future. That he suffered. That he, he joined you to himself. Willingly. Because he loves you. Now, do other people get convinced about things other than the gospel and even wicked things that cause them to take action? All the time. So what's the difference? Look at the fruit. The crowds, verse 6, with one accord, united, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. He too was doing signs. Unclean spirits were being casted out. People were being healed. And then verse, the last verse of that paragraph, there was much joy in that city. There was a time, I believe it's Luke chapter 11, that the Lord Jesus was being accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, by the power of Satan. You remember what Jesus' response was? Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided household fails. He goes on to say, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's evidence. The city was filled with joy. Notice where the joy was directed. It was not at Philip. Philip was proclaiming the greatness of Jesus, proclaiming to them the greatness of Christ. And then we come across Simon the Magician, known as Simon Magus. You can kind of see the tone of the writing kind of take a turns. He amazed the people of Samaria, but he declared himself great. People paid attention to him too. Verse 10, people said, this man is the power of God that is called great. He amazed people with his magic. But when they heard the good news from Philip, they believed. And yes, even he believed. He was a believer. The second point on your outline there says it's not enough to see and believe. But we use those words, don't we? Believer, somebody's a believer, somebody's an unbeliever. We use, and those, those words are fine. But what we see from this text, seeing and believing is not enough. Even, verse 13, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. I think the Apostle James says it best. Even the demons believe. Where does that leave Simon? Seeing and believing is not enough. Now, the apostles in Jerusalem heard about what was happening in Samaria. They heard about the great joy. When they heard it, they were sent. Peter and John were sent to Samaria. They prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit, and yet it had not yet fallen on them. What's going on here? 
Most of us, if not all of us, at one time or another have heard of Pentecostalism. And uh, we have Pentecostal brothers and sisters in Christ. We do. I, when I first became a Christian, I became a member of a Pentecostal church. One of the distinctives of Pentecostalism is a subsequent baptism, another baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're reading this text, you're like, well, there it is. That's the, the second baptism right there. It's important to note that what is happening at this point in the history of the church is a very specific thing for a very particular time. For instance, if you remember last week, we went back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus laid out how he was going to unfold the mission of God. Remember how he did? He did it geographically. And he said, first it's going to be in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, we have Pentecost. The Spirit comes down. Where? Jerusalem. Now we're in Acts chapter 8. Where is the Spirit coming down? This is, in essence, the Samaritan Pentecost that's happening here. God's unfolding his promises for us. We also should not knock Philip here. Remember, Philip is a Greek-speaking Jew. He has a Greek name. He wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. Not that he had to be one of Jesus' disciples, but the fact that two Hebrew-speaking Jews came from Jerusalem and prayed that the Spirit would come down upon the Samaritans shows us that there is not a separate Samaritan church. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope that, belong, that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And when Simon the magician saw this, he wanted this too. He thought he could buy it from them. Have you ever heard the term simony? Simony? During the Protestant Reformation, this is one of the things that led to the Protestant Reformation. People of the church buying for themselves office, indulgences. That's where the word Simon knee comes from, from Simon. And I love Peter's response here. Peter's response, may your silver perish with you, he said. You can literally say, in other words, to hell with your money. This kind of stuff happens within the church all the time. I'm going to give money in order to be right with God. I'm going to put on a new building, a new floor, Now, I don't want to discourage us from giving money. We need it. <laughs> but if we think that giving is going to make us right with God, we are going to perish. And this is, <laughs> there's no amount of money that would be enough. It all belongs to God anyways. And it, that's just one manifestation of the fallen default condition of our hearts. How else does it look? If I go to church, I'm going to be right with God this week. 
if I go to Sunday school, and you should go to Sunday school, and you should come to church. I'm going to be right with God. Nope. If I'm a deacon, a deaconess, an elder, a Sunday school teacher, that ain't going to do it. If I take communion this week, you're going to perish. That is antithetical to the gospel. It is anti-gospel. The gospel is free. The word itself is good news. You don't do anything. You can't do it. That's the default condition of our hearts. And I tell you the same thing that Peter says. And it's really the key verse of this whole passage. It's verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. In the end... Peter and John went back to Jerusalem. He went along the way preaching the gospel to villages in Samaria. But we don't know what happened to Simon. We have this thing in our church. It's called a vision statement. Raise your hand if you know our vision statement. Not enough. I'm going to do that more. It's printed on every front cover of the bulletin. It's on the front of our website. It's on the front top of the email that goes out every Friday. It says, to know and extend the transforming love of Jesus Christ. I think it's obvious that we can't extend the transforming love of Jesus if we don't know it. And when we say no, I'm not talking about like, I know this person, or I, I, I know of this person. It's definitely not that. Or I know about this person. It's no, like a father knows his son, or a son knows his father. How a wife knows her husband. Or brothers and sisters know each other. Twins like that, no. an intimate, one-on-one -on -one knowledge. I'll tell you, the biggest burden for a pastor, and it's a good, healthy burden. Do the people that the Lord has placed in my care, do they really know the Lord? Like Philip knows him. Not like Simon knows him. I'm going to get really practical right now. How is it that we can know that we are born of the Spirit of God? i got five ways, and we'll, I'll finish up with this. Five ways that we can know that we were born of the Spirit of God. And this is taken from somebody who wrote several hundred years ago. And he was preaching on a passage, and this can be a good homework assignment. First John chapter 4. The Lord invites us to come and test the spirits. Number one. How do we know that we've been born of the Spirit? The truth of the gospel has been confirmed and established in my mind. It's been confirmed and established that Jesus is the Son of God, and the Savior of men. Number two. How do I know the Spirit? I, I've been born of the Spirit of God. Are my intentions operating against the kingdom of this world? 
In other words, the kingdom of Satan. Third, do I have a high regard for the scriptures? I realize that this is to various degrees with maturity and experience. Some people in this room read through the Bible two or three times a year. Some work through one chapter a week. But is there a regard for the scriptures, a high regard for the scriptures? Number four, is there a desire in you that seeks after the truth about God? Is there something inside of you that causes you to, to want to know who God is and how he works? And lastly, I'll close with this. You can know that the Spirit of God is at work when you are stirred to love. When you're stirred to love. When, when, when you're stirred to, to love God and to love your neighbor. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the good news, the gospel offered freely to sinners like us, undeserving sufferers like us too. You have inviting us to be joined to yourself, to be reconciled. You have made it possible that we can know you through Jesus. Pray for any heart in this room that does not know you. Lord, pour out your spirit upon them. May your grace abound here at Calvary. For your sake and for your name. Amen.